Yesterday I'd, I'd mentioned there was this issue with conduction band valleys in silicon. So in the center here, Doug Paul, I found a nice pretty picture on the internet from Doug, uh, is just a bulk piece of silicon and these blue surfaces are constant energy surfaces for electrons in silicon. This is in K space. In, uh, and so there are six equivalent minima, which means there's a degeneracy in there. And for quantum information, we'd like to have our qubit, but not have any other degeneracies that it might get mixed up with. Uh, when you make a silicon, silicon, germanium heterostructure, there's a great deal of strain in there because they have different lattice constants. And so it splits it with the, what are called the out of plane valleys, I mean, the in-plane valley is going up very high in energy. That energy in a typical sample is several hundred milli-electron volts. Whereas there are still two states that it would be degenerate. Now, because, because there's an interface, you have something that looks like this, and you're going to have a wave function that goes something like that. These interface... The, the boundary conditions pick out a particular combination of those two valleys. It's the ground state. And then there'll be what people like to call the, the valley splitting, which will be, there'll be another combination of states from those two, two valleys that'll be at a higher energy. But it's not much higher. Uh, and it, what has been found is that... Uh, if you make something quite small, so probably once you get down in the range of a couple hundred nanometers, uh, the splitting gets to be large enough that it's not a problem. Uh, the issue is that there's surface roughness on here. And as you go down, this is my quantum well here, as you go down the well, there's some places where the atoms are here and then that may be out here and back and forth. And so there's surface roughness, and depending on that, so that's changing that boundary condition, and that changes the um, which one of the states wants to be the ground state. By making it small enough, just, well, there's a group at Wisconsin who looked at this fairly carefully, uh, theoretically as well as experimentally, and then just everybody else doing experiments. What we find is that if you make something small enough, that splitting is large enough that we can have well-defined spin qubits, though often what it means is that the first excited state, the orbital excited state, spatial excited state, is not as high in energy as it would be, say, in gallium arsenide. In gallium arsenide, there's just a single, it's not degenerate, it's all just near k equals zero. So I had, uh, I had mentioned that, and I thought I would... Uh, I thought yesterday I had this picture and I couldn't find it on my computer, so I downloaded it again last night. Um, so what I'm going to talk about to today is I'm going to finish up a little bit on, on the quantum dots. Uh, and in particular, the question is, okay, we've done these single dot measurements. We've done it in gallium arsenide. We've done it in silicon. I say we, the community has. I haven't done any of those things. Uh, but uh, a completely different way of measuring gives us some very interesting, well, a good handle on what the limits might be of what is the longest coherence we can expect. And so that's what I'm going to talk about now. This is an ensemble measurement. So it is, well, I'll show, but we need many spins. Uh, I think now we've built some new things in the lab, and maybe now we can get down to about 10 to the 7 spins, but certainly not one. That's and, well, the more the merrier. If we have a bigger signal, nobody gets upset. Uh, but, yeah, we typically are in that range. So we're doing a spatial ensemble, many different spins. Um, I should point out, often we will not do time ensembles. Often we'll have a single, in, the, in our case, we do a pulse of microwaves. Often we'll get our signal from a single pulse. So we will do spatial ensembles, but probably not in many cases, not time ensembles. Uh, I should point out that many of the single dot experiments, especially in the earlier 
experiments where they'd measure, uh, say, the T1 of a spin. It turns out they could not do that originally on one shot. They had to do it many times. Repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, maybe not 10 to the 8 times, but probably 10 to the 5 times in order to get enough signal to noise. And so those were time ensembles. Uh, as I showed, there was, I think at the end yesterday, I showed an experiment where uh, Mark Erickson's group at, at Wisconsin had done a single shot measurement of uh, the spin in a, in a silicon quantum dot. So that was one shot, one electron, one spin, no ensembles at all, no averaging of any kind. Uh, if you're going to measure one of these times, like T1 or T2, you have to make many measurements, right? One measurement gives you one number. And if you want to do something, you have to get many numbers to fill in all the points. So you'll have to, you'll have to do some sort of ensemble, but it may be that uh, each one is a different, say, a different time step. You take a, you step your time and, and so forth. Um, one of the advantages is that very often the sample preparation is much easier. Now, the first one I'm going to show you is not that. It's very hard. Uh, but uh, in, when we get and start talking about donors, all it consists of is we take, well, I say it's easy. For us, it's easy. Somebody has worked incredibly hard to make some of the very best silicon anybody has ever seen. And after all that work, and it's millions of dollars because it was done for something else, we get little pieces, all we have to do is cut them and get them the right size and stick them in. So for us, it's quite easy. Easier? Well, if you have to make quantum dots, right? You have to do E-beam lithography, all these things. It's, it's hard to make good quantum dots. You have to be very careful how you process it so you don't... Once you know, you can, once you know once you've done the initial... In principle. But you know experiments, they're, they never do what they're supposed to do. So I know, for example, well, I'll show some data where uh, Andrea Morello's group in University of New South Wales measured a, uh, a T2 for a single uh, electron on a donor, on one donor. Uh, they were delayed by several months because all of a sudden nothing worked. You know, they, they'd made a bunch of samples and, you know, three out of four devices worked, suddenly nothing worked. And they, I don't know if they ever figured it they, they have it working again, but you know how experiments are. They, they, they have their own idea of what should, which, what should happen. So, electron spin resonance, I'm going to explain just a little bit about spin resonance. Uh, the basic idea is we have a magnet. Uh, we put our hunk of silicon that has a spin, so I'm going to be doing silicon uh, with all of this. It splits uh, spin up and spin down, and the energy is given by that. Uh, that energy for the typical fields we're going to work at. So I guess everything I'm going to talk about today was done at a field of about one-third of a Tesla, which this number there, that energy splitting, in frequency units turns out to be 10 gigahertz or nine and a half, which is just a very convenient frequency to use because there's a lot of electronics that works around there. Um, so we can shoot in microwaves, we can adjust the magnetic field so that we bring that into resonance with our microwaves. Often it's easier to tune the field than the microwaves. And here's an example. Uh, we are gonna look at, this is what's called CW spin resonance, and what we're going to do is we're going to, this red curve is what you get from natural silicon. And uh, what we're seeing here is the absorption, we're measuring the absorption of the microwaves by this two-level system. So we're coming in with quite low power, we're not doing anything nonlinear or trying not to. Uh, what's happening is, you say, well, first off, why are there two lines? Well, it's because we have phosphorus doped silicon is what we're looking at. And the phosphorus is phosphorus 31. And phosphorus 31 has a nuclear spin of 1 half. So one of these lines corresponds to that nuclear spin pointing up. And one of the lines corresponds to the nuclear spin pointing down. And this is called the hyperfine splitting. Uh, this is a magnetic field. Now you may ask, why is it this funny shape? Absorption should just go up and come down. For experimental reasons, 
uh, you always modulate the magnetic field a little bit, and so you get a derivative. That's all. So most of the things I'll show you, a lot of them will be derivatives. Well, this is probably the only CW one I'll show you, so maybe this will be the only, only one of that variety. Um, now, why is there a line width? And the reason there's a line width, this is natural silicon. It's about 5% of silicon 29, naturally occurring silicon, three isotopes. 28 is, I guess, about 91, 92%. I don't remember. Uh, silicon 30 has no nuclear spin. It's a couple percent. Silicon 29 has a nuclear spin, and it's about 5%. Uh, and what's happening is I have an electron bound to that donor, and I, the donor looks like a little positive charge inside this piece of silicon, and it just looks like a hydrogen atom. However, it's modified by the fact that the dielectric constant of silicon is much larger than the dielectric constant of the vacuum, and so that causes the energies to go down. Also, we have to... We have to include the fact that the mass of this electron is the effective mass in the silicon. So that also makes the energies lower. So instead of 13, a Rydberg, 13 electron volts to ionize a hydrogen atom, this looks like a hydrogen atom, but with an ionization energy of about 50 milli electron volts. And it has a much larger wave function. So the uh, radius of that wave function is about two nanometers, right? 20 angstroms, whereas the radius of the hydrogen atom is half an angstrom. So it's big, it covers many silicon atoms. It's inside the electron wave function. And what that means is that there's some of these silicon 29s, and some of those 29s have spin up, some have spin down. It's completely random. And so you get a wide line because, you know, uh, this guy here had one, two up, one down. This guy here had two down, one up, and they're going to be in... And this is, of course, a cartoon. So that is the red curve. The black curve, well, it's noisy in the middle, but you can see it has a very sharp line and another very sharp line. And that's because this has been isotopically enriched to the point of being uh, about... This is about 800 part per million of silicon-29. So it's been enriched to have much less silicon-29, and so it's quite likely that your, your donor wave function, there won't be any silicon-29s, there are only a few. And so you get a much narrower line. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about spin echoes a little bit, or about Hahn echoes. So, uh, and the picture is, this was, I, I explained it a little bit, it's analogous to that singlet, triplet, qubit that Jason Petta did, where you could allow things to evolve and they went out of phase, and then you turn them back and they come back into phase. So here, the picture is, imagine you have a bunch of bicycle riders, and uh, this guy fires his pistol, and they all start riding. Some ride faster, some ride slower. They ride at a constant speed. Each guy goes at his own speed. Well, they get all mixed up. Now, at this point, this guy fires his gun again and says, okay, everybody, turn around and ride the other way at exactly the speed you were going before. So what will happen? They'll ride the other way, and after a time that's equal to that time, they'll all come back together. Right? They've all been riding the same speed. And so that is what we're going to do. We're going to do what we call a pi over 2 pulse, which on the block sphere, we're going to start with our spins at the North Pole, and we're going to make a superposition, an equal superposition of 0 and 1, up and down. So it's, uh, we can make any phase that we want by adjusting the phase of our microwaves. But let's just say we have 0 plus 1 over square root of 2. Now, what will happen is it takes a little while for those to go out of phase with one another. And remember, these are all magnetic dipoles. So as long as they're in phase, we have this rotating magnetic dipole that's rotating at 10 gigahertz and it radiates some microwaves. And that lasts for a little while until everybody gets out of phase. And then once everybody gets out of phase, there's no coherent emission and, and you, you don't get any more mi microwave emission. This pi pulse tells everybody, go back the other way. So we had them here. We're going to do a pi pulse and we're going to send them to the opposite side of the sphere. And then after this time, we get this echo because they'll all come back into phase. Now, 
in real life, things happen. Uh, so here are bicycle riders, and a couple things can happen, which I talked about. First off, the spins can just get knocked by something completely out. These guys, there's no way they're coming back in phase, right? They're, they're you know, he said, return, they're not getting back in phase. Uh, these guys are probably going to come back exactly the way they were supposed to. Guys back here, well, they have to steer around this mess, right? And so they're going to have to slow down. So they're going to come back, but not in phase. And so they won't contribute to that echo pulse. And in the simplest picture, that echo will decay exponentially. You can get non-exponentials, I'll show some. Uh, but that, ex that uh, the echo will decay exponentially, and with the total time being 2 tau, and we define this T2 in this way, e to the minus 2 tau over T2 is a fit to that. All right? I don't know if there's a bicycle up there, and I... <laughs> yeah. So, here's an animation. We did our, our pi over 2 pulse. Now they're going out of phase with one another. And so they're spreading around the block sphere. Now we do our pi pulse here. And now they're all going to come back into phase over here. And when they get into phase, their magnetic dipoles all in phase, they radiate microwaves. And this is what we pick up. And this thing will repeat until you're tired of it. Uh, I think we're tired of it. So, one of the things we wanted to do is say, can we understand what is the spin coherence of electrons in these silicon quantum dots? I should say, we're not going to do anything with gallium arsenide. And the reason is that the, with all the nuclei in gallium arsenide, the experiments get extremely difficult. I don't even know if we could do some of these measurements in gallium arsenide. Uh, we've never tried. I've talked to friends, we've talked about, well, maybe one of us should try it. And we said, no, that's too much work. Uh, so we haven't tried it in gallium arsenide. And, and we already know from, from Levin van der Sypen's experiments on single electron dots that it's the, the coherence time of an electron in gallium arsenide is of order a half a microsecond, just from all the nuclear spins around. OK, so what we did was we made a sample like this. This part down here is this. Silicon, germanium, and then silicon, that's our quantum well, this thing. And then what we do is then there's more silicon germanium. This did not have any modulation doping. And that's how we were able to get this to work. We put down an insulator layer. It's called atomic layer deposition. It's just an inexpensive little machine that, that puts down one layer at a time, a layer of Al203. It's not crystalline, not here certainly. But it's a good insulator. So we use that. And then what we do is we put down a metal gate and we cut, doing E-beam lithography, we cut a bunch of holes in that metal gate. We put down another insulator layer and we put a top gate. So now the idea is we can make this lower gate sort of negative, make the top gate positive. The field from there will go down through those holes. And the only place we'll get an electron or electrons are underneath the holes. So this is our quantum dot. Uh, here is a picture of that structure. In this particular one, we use an extremely high mobility sample. We'd been trying different things, and we were running into a lot of trouble. So we said, let's get just the highest mobility we can. Uh, and that puts the well, the silicon well, has to be fairly deep. And so we had to make rather large openings. So these are 350 nanometers. And we drew these with electron beam lithography. Um, so this is that intermediate metal layer that we've cut the holes in. Uh, this is the sample. This is a US quarter, which is about the size, I guess, of, a, of some of the two rupee pieces. Oh, it's yay big. Uh, it takes quite a while to. There, I think this one has 1.2 times 10 to the 8 holes in it. It takes quite a while for the electron beam lithography machine to do that. I think it was 36 hours. Jason Petta and his graduate students were getting rather upset that we were occupying the, the e-beam lithography machine for so long. If you look at...
at what should the potential look like under there, you end up with essentially a, almost like a sinusoidal potential uh, down in the quantum well layer, down at the bottom. And for the kinds of voltages we are going to put on, it has an oscillation height of about 15 milli electron volts, which when you put in the numbers of the sizes and all, this thing to a first approximation is a harmonic oscillator. You figure out the energy levels and it's split by about a millivolt. So we have orbital states. Now, that's in the simple, that doesn't include the valleys. Our hope is, and it seems to work, that things were small enough that maybe there'd be one configuration of valleys here and another one here and another one there, but each one would have a configuration of valleys such that the valley splitting was large enough that we didn't get some degeneracy in there. And experimentally, that seems to happen. So we've gone and done a bunch of things, but the end result is we looked at T1 and T2 versus that upper gate voltage and the lower gate voltage. These experiments, it doesn't say, are done at about 300 millikelvin. Uh, oh, I guess this has 2 times 10 to the 8 dots. The new samples have 1 on a quarter times 10 to the 8. Uh, very high mobility to start with. This was all done with natural silicon. So a friend who's a professor in Taiwan, he'd been a student at Princeton with a friend down the hall, and Chi Wee had gotten a new machine, and he got these mobilities that were over a million. He sent some samples to Dan Sui, and Dan's group, and Dan's last student measured them, and they are an order of magnitude better mobility, pretty much, than, than any samples previously done, probably because they didn't have any doping in them. Um, but at any rate, what you see is T1 and T2 are in the range of a few hundred microseconds. Uh, interestingly, there are regions here where T2 is larger than T1. So the, uh, the mathematics says that the maximum T2 can be is twice T1. And it gets almost twice T1 in some of these places. What that tells us is that the process that is causing decoherence is almost entirely a spin flip process. And we have some ideas of what's going on and we're making smaller dots now to test those out. But what you find is you're getting several hundred microseconds out of this. So if you, uh, if you remember uh, in some of the other experiments, uh, people had been getting coherence times often quite a bit shorter. So in gallium arsenide, you know, a few microseconds, this sort of thing, or half a microsecond, and actually in gallium arsenide, the analogous experiment. Silicon, just because it has far fewer nuclear spins, we can get quite a bit longer coherence. Uh, the fact that T2 is larger than T1 says that we're not being limited by the silicon 29 at this point. And we're trying to figure out exactly what's going on. But the bottom line is we're getting quite respectable uh, coherence out of these quantum dots. Uh, you'll see in a minute... Um, well, we can do much better with, with donors, but they're a much simpler system. They don't have all this processing. So I posed this question before, and let me now tell you uh, two answers to this. Do we need to use singlet, triplet, qubits in silicon? So the simple answer is no. We're getting coherence times of several hundred microseconds without doing that singlet, triplet, qubit that Jason Petta did. So on that argument, we don't need it for coherence. And I think those times, uh, as, we, as we do more experiments, I think we're going to get quite a bit longer times. Uh, you know, we're already longer than the singlet triplet qubits, even when they use dynamical, the CPMG, this dynamical decoupling to try and extend it. Uh, if you went to the world's best silicon 28, and if you had similarly enriched uh, germanium, uh, you don't. It's it's not. You don't get a lot of improvement in the coherence from doing isotopic enrichment here. You'd get uh, so what the numbers that people got in the quantum dots in the silicon quantum dots are of the order of a uh, that. That experiment that had the, the double dot in the silicon that did this, tried, well, they could not do a singlet triplet qubit for 
technical things. But they saw 300 nanosecond, that T2 star, the difference in the rate at which the spins evolve here and here, that's probably associated with this uh, silicon 29. That only goes as the square root of the silicon 29 density. So in the very best material, we'd get 30 times 300 nanoseconds, or about 10 microseconds from that. So I guess the point is that uh, doing the singlet triplet wouldn't buy you anything for coherence. Uh, and if you do do those, those singlet triplet qubits, now you constantly have this interaction turned on. And if there's any noise, electrical noise, on your gate voltages, it changes the strength of the, of the exchange interaction. That goes exponentially with the overlap. And so uh, the dynamical decoupling that, that Amir Yacobi did in the gallium arsenide, in the end, they were limited by the noise from the gates. They could get up to about 300, 250, 300 odd uh, microseconds. And it was the gate noise, the voltages applied to the gate. You're having to do this with, on sub-nanosecond time scales. The other question, a different question, would we like to use singlet triplet? And there's one argument for it. Uh, the answer is maybe. And the reason you can, the maybe answer is because you can do very, very fast, sub-nanosecond, one qubit operations, right? Just by changing the, the exchange interaction. Uh, however, then two qubit gates become a lot more complicated. So, uh, my own personal, I, I say no, but I collaborate with a group at Wisconsin with Mark Erickson, and they, they sort of think, well, maybe yes. Uh, so it's each to his own. We'll see. We don't know yet. So now let me switch. Okay, so we're done with all the, the quantum dot stuff. Uh, what we've learned is that, yes, we can make quantum dots. We can make single electron quantum dots. We can do the measurements. And at least in silicon, spin coherence is pretty good. We're up close to a millisecond. And as I said, I think when we do more experiments, I think we're going to get a fair bit longer times there. But now we're going to talk about donors. This was, I mean, all the other part was the sort of uh, Los DiVincenzo quantum dot scheme. Now we're going to do Bruce Kane's... Uh, donor scheme, and here is a picture. What he was trying to show is how he would do a two-qubit gate, how to turn on an exchange interaction. And the idea is, well, I have this, I have a donor here and a donor here, and this would be, say, silicon dioxide here, so an insulator. And what I'd do is I'd apply a voltage there and I'd pull the electron wave function up close to the interface, and then I'd make that positive so that electron wave function could sort of leak over there and I'd do the same with him and those wave functions would overlap and we get an exchange interaction. And you can draw the picture very well. The only problem is that donor is two nanometers in radius. So the characteristic scale across here is a couple nanometers. Uh, nobody has shown that they can do do something like this. It's just the distances are so small. Maybe we'll learn how in some time. Uh, you could shut it off by making that gate negative and that pushes those electrons back away. So um, the qubit is, in fact, in Bruce's scheme, the qubit is a nuclear spin of a phosphorus 31. I'll say a little bit about that. Um, we've measured some, uh, some nuclear T2s, actually. Some of my, well, uh, a, uh, a research staff member and one of my graduate students just got some new data that they sent me last night, so uh, I'll show that. Uh, Bruce's idea was that electrons, he'd use electron spins to do all the interactions, and then they would be used to manipulate the nuclear spins. Uh, you tune by distorting the wave functions, you control all that. Uh, we, Bruce already knew in the 50s measurements had been done showing that you had long T1s and actually pretty long T2s for donors in silicon. So, uh, as Barry Sanders mentioned, when Bruce first came up with that idea, he was working in, in University of New South Wales, and they have a big program to try and make this all work. And first what I want to do is talk about a single electron transistor. So what we need is we need to be able to detect, is there an electron here or not? So. In the quantum dot world, 
you often use these quantum point contacts. You, you just need a very high gain something down there, transistor-like thing. Uh, another thing that uh, people use, and sometimes in quantum dots they use what are called single electron transistors. Uh, Susan Angus did this, this one. Uh, the structure here is what you see on the surface is aluminum. The way it's made, they've doped over here and doped over there, and they first put down these two lines. And then you can just take your thing out and put it on a little hot plate. Uh, Sydney's not very humid, so you probably don't need too much humidity around, and it oxidizes the aluminum. If you did it in Princeton, you'd probably have to do it a little differently because it's often quite humid. Uh, but that makes an insulator layer over that, and then they put down this other layer. And what you end up with then is you can adjust the voltages on those two gates. And so you have electrons. This is now silicon with a silicon dioxide layer on it. So it's silicon down here, silicon dioxide, just like what you'd semiconductor industry would use. Um, and so you can make a tunnel barrier there and a tunnel barrier there. And if this island is small enough, just that the capacitance is very small, right? the energy to an, add an electron, right, to charge your capacitor, is a half Q squared over C, so one electron is E squared over the capacitance. So if you make this very small, and you can see it's pretty small, it's a fairly large energy. And the idea is if we put one electron, one more electron in there, now we'd have to change the biases enough to make up that energy, that E squared over C, in order to add another electron. So we don't have a single electron in here. Uh, often they work with a few hundred electrons in this island, you call it. Uh, so if you look down here, we have this we can think of as just a Fermi degenerate system. This we can think of as a Fermi degenerate system. Inside here is a Fermi degenerate system with tunnel barriers. But the first state that we can add an electron to is E squared over C above the last state here because of this charging energy. So as I've drawn it right now, no current can flow. I get zero current because it can't tunnel all the way through there. It has to tunnel in here and then tunnel again. It would be too hard to tunnel all the way through that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to change this, what the people call the plunger gate. And what we can do then is change the energy of these electrons with respect to everything else. And we'll, we'll make the, that plunger gate more positive. Now we bring that level down. Now current can flow. And if we look, if we measure current versus plunger gate voltage, current goes up. Raise the plunger gate a little more, that electron is now in, so it's part of that Fermi C, right? So now we put that we put an electron and it's gotten trapped, and now we have E squared over C again, and now that energy level's way up here, so we've turned off the current. So as you scan that plunger gate, you get very sharp spikes in current. How sharp they are really depends on how cold your electrons are. There's a smearing, KT smearing. And, uh, and that's what limits you. OK, so that is how they are going to detect. What they did was, here's another one of those same things. Here's the, we, it's turned around. So the plunger gate is over here. And what they did was they took an ion implanter and put about a dozen phosphorus atoms in here. They, had to, they couldn't do it with just one, because when you shoot an ion in, you don't know exactly where it's going to end up. So they put in about a dozen. And the idea is they want to have one that's going to be able to, the electron is going to be able to easily tunnel from the phosphorus donor that's it's shown here on the top, but really it's down in the silicon. From the phosphorus donor over to that SET island, that little region in there. And so here is, now it's just like the quantum dots. We're going to measure T1. First, what we're going to do, here's our, the energy of the electrons in our SET island. We're going to raise that up. Electrons are going to jump into the donor. So here is a donor potential. It's spin split. You put on a couple Tesla field. Uh, 
and it's spin split, sometimes you'll get a spin up, sometimes you'll get a spin down electron. You now adjust the voltage to be about here. If you have a spin up electron, it can jump out. If you have a spin down electron, it can't. If you held it for a while, remember this is this SET will only, I mean this donor, it can only, it'll only take one electron. You can actually bind a second electron, but very weakly. So you can adjust your voltages so at most one electron will go over. So you can wait for a while and then bring it to this condition. And if, if it's that electron, it jumps out. If it's not, and this is just like what we saw with the quantum dots. Uh, if it was the down case, nothing. If it's the up case, what you will do is you'll get a pulse of current, and then it'll capture an electron and turn off the current. Right? This is the current through the SET. Right? So we'll capture an electron over to the donor. That changes the energy levels in the SET. We hit current to go through, and then we turn it off. And this is one shot, one electron. Right? So this is a single shot experiment, and you can see at this point an electron uh, jumped off and then another one with the opposite spin jumped on. All right? And this was all spin down. And sort of, of order, half the time when you load it, you get one of these, and when you load it, about half the time you get one of those. So about half the time, you do not see that. You just see noise. The other half of the time, you see a, a pulse. And in fact, now you can go through and you do this many times, and you can analyze the pulse heights and the noise, and you can figure out the fidelity, and they're well over 90% fidelity in a single shot measuring that electron. And they measured T1 by this delay business and got a number of about six seconds, which is uh, reasonable for electrons actually at their field. It's probably about what you'd expect. Uh, at lower fields, you can get hours. Now they measured T2. It's just like in the quantum dot. You have the same thing here. Here, they, they bend it around a little bit. But here is that top aluminum. Here's the plunger gate. Here are those two little gates that define the tunnel barriers. You implant about a dozen donors in here. But then you have this shorted microwave transmission line with now a microwave current will flow through that. It'll give you a magnetic field and can drive spin rotations. And you can then, right, this looks very much like the Robbie oscillations that Levin van der Seypen's group saw in gallium arsenide quantum dots. The only difference is that Levin's lasted for half a microsecond, and the scale here is 15 microseconds out here. Uh, and in fact, when they analyzed everything and put it all together, they tried different powers. These are Robbie oscillations just to show that it was doing what it should do. Uh, they obtain a T2 of about 400 micro, uh, about 200 microseconds. Likely that's the residual silicon 29. They didn't have isotopically enriched silicon in that case. Uh, it may also, they put about a dozen donors in here, and they're pretty close. So the donor-donor interactions may also contribute to that. Uh, and if they did dynamical decoupling, which would get, it wouldn't affect the donor-donor interactions much but it would affect the silicon 29, and they got it out to about 400 microseconds. Uh, that was just this year. So, can do single spin T1, T2 measurements on donors, and they're respectable. They're a few hundred microseconds. So now the question is, okay, done that experiment, what else do we know about donor spin coherence in silicon? So first off, we do that pulse experiment. We do that Han echo. And this is, we adjusted it to be the most pathological case we could. Uh, this is what you see with phosphorus doped natural silicon. Uh, and you, I mean, there are these oscillations, and all this has to do with the silicon 29s. You can see it's not exponential. I mean, it's got oscillations. There's nothing like exponential. It's, but even the, the even the envelope isn't exponential. Um, if you then do very similar sample, about a few times 10 to the 16, but this has been isotopically enriched to about 800 part per million silicon 29 instead of 
Now you get this decay. It turns out there's a non-exponential part that's not the silicon. That's an instrumental thing. That, uh, But you see it's going out hundreds of microseconds. And what's limiting it there are the interactions between the donors. This is re relatively dense array of donors. At 10 to the 16 per cubic centimeter, uh, well, what? At 10 to the 18, there are about 100. At 10 to the 15, there are uh, 1,000 angstroms apart. So we have well under 1,000 angstrom separation. So they're pretty close and they interact. Pardon? No, no. This is about two orders of magnitude below metal. Uh, you do start seeing some pairing. So you so at, at as you go up at high densities, uh, you end up with uh, donors get close enough together that the exchange interaction is large, and you can get uh, lines in different places. Actually, I'll mention uh, just because Thayer Thayer did all that. Uh, he had measured this in the 1950s doing CW spin resonance. Uh, and it turns out it was trying to understand that data that led to Phil Anderson coming up uh, with the theory of localization. It was based on George Fayer's data. And Phil's, well, officially he's retired, but Phil never retires. Uh, and he's at Princeton. And I asked him one time, why didn't they keep going? And it turns out uh, at about that time, Fayer decided he'd done all kinds of things in, in uh, spin resonance in silicon, and he left and moved to, he was at Bell Labs, he moved to California, went to San Diego, and started biophysics. And I think got divorced and remarried and all kinds of things going on. So Phil said, oh well, you know, they found other things to do. Uh, he did very well, he's a very smart guy, fair. Uh, he did very well in biophysics, I should point out. Uh, so these are measurements of T1. You see they're going up to times like 10 to the 3 seconds down at 1 Kelvin. Right? The 10 to the 3 seconds is what, 15 minutes, something like that. That's T1. Uh, and we measured it out here. Uh, we have it plotted funny. This is just an Arrhenius plot from about here on out. We just have a linear, a tenth of a percent. So Jim Gordon, you may or may not have heard of him, but he was the graduate student who made the first laser. A uh, maser, I'm sorry, not laser. He worked for Charlie Towns. And in fact, I was at a conference a few years ago, and Towns is about 90, and he was giving a talk. And he said the biggest, well, the, the thing that went wrong was that Jim Gordon didn't get the Nobel Prize with him, because he said Jim Gordon did a large fraction of the work on the maser. Uh, so Jim was at Bell Labs, and uh, he made a maser. He went to Bell Labs and he said, hey, this guy Fayer has measured these things with microwaves and, and spins. Can I make a maser with phosphorus doped silicon? And he did. And he had measured T2. So these are T2 data. And he had measured, this was the first microwave spin echo experiment ever done uh, to measure T2. Jim is a pretty clever guy. Uh, let me say, what is limiting that is donor-donor interactions. I don't, is it written there? I don't think so. Ah, neither one of them. This is dope. This black line here is doped about 10 to the 16. It was that piece I showed before. What's limiting you are interactions between the, between the donors. If you think about it, uh, we have all these donors. All their spins say they're aligned, then we put them down with our pi over 2 pulse. Well, they feel a magnetic field of one another. This whole idea of the spin echo is that as long as whatever background inhomogeneities you have, as long as they stay constant, then everything comes back in phase. Right? As long as all the bicycle riders, each guy rides at his own rate and doesn't change. But if you have two spins, their magnetic fields can interact, and it changes the speed at which the spin goes. And what you can do then is say, all right, we're going to, and that goes by a, a very odd name called instantaneous diffusion. Phil Anderson is usually, a paper of Phil Anderson's is usually referenced. I one time asked him, how did you ever come up with that name? And he said, that's the most ridiculous name, and he had nothing to do with it. He was rather... Uh, incensed that he would be accused of that. Uh, 
But at any rate, what you can do, you see out here, we do our pi over 2 poles, and now we have two spins here, right? And they're both pointing up, and this guy has a field on him. Now we do our pi poles, we flip them both. Now his field has reverse sign. And so during this period, that spin will be processing with one magnetic field. During this period, it'll be processing with a different magnetic field. And so this gives you an apparent loss of coherence, which isn't real. It just has to do with the interactions between them. The way you can get rid of that is say, what happens if we flip this spin is the one we want to measure, but don't flip that one. Right? Well, all we have to do is put in a lower power microwave pulse. And then we only, so a pi pulse flips every spin. If we do a smaller pulse, there's a probability of being flipped, which goes down and down with the power in that pulse. And that just turns out to be sine squared of the, of the angle through which you, you tip the spin. And so what you find is that if you plot this as a function of basically how much power you put in, you get, this is 1 over T2. They get longer and longer and longer T2s. And you could say, well, if we could go all the way to zero pulse here, the problem is you're losing signal through all of this. If you could go all the way to zero, this would tell you what your real T2 is. And uh, here at 8 Kelvin, our T2 was about 14 milliseconds. And if we went a little colder, it went up to 60 milliseconds. We're in the range where it was limited by, the, uh, by temperature. And so what you can do, this now has... Jim's sample was about 10 to the 16. That sample was about 10 to the 16. And you can see it's getting basically the same number Jim got. Uh, a 10 to the 15 sample gets higher just because the spins are farther apart so they don't interact. And if you do this, uh, this extrapolation, the extrapolated T2 is all the way up here, basically right where it should be at T1. So now the question is, how far up this curve can we push T2? And so then you go and you find out that there are people who want to define a new standard kilogram. So the standard kilogram that sits in a double vault in Paris, it's a platinum iridium thing made by some London jewelry shop or something, is losing mass. It's getting lighter. Not very much. The best guess is that there are very microscopic bubbles of gas that are leaking out of it. That's the best guess. Nobody knows. And so people wanted to come up with a new standard kilogram. And a group in Berlin had the idea, look, if we can make a perfect sphere of isotopically, chemically pure silicon, and we make this perfect sphere, then all we have to do is measure the diameter of the sphere. And we can do that interferometrically with a laser. And we'll know the mass exactly. And so that meant that they had to make very good silicon. Well, I have, well, I wouldn't mind having one of those. They made two of these spheres. I wouldn't mind having one, but I don't need it. You see, when you make a crystal of silicon, you pull a, essentially a cylinder. So to make a sphere, you have to cut a bunch off. And it's all the pieces that get cut off that we use. So that's our, so this is highly enriched. The very best material is 50 part per million uh, silicon 29, so 10 times better almost 20 times better than the stuff we'd had before. Very high chemical purity. Uh, in, the, in the best material, it's about 10 to the 12 per cubic centimeter. Very low density of impurity. And they're big. You get a big sample, so it has a lot of spins in it. Oh, you can't buy these. It's, it's, you have to know people. Right, so uh, I had mentioned that a fellow, uh, Mike Thewalt, he's at Simon Fraser. He, it turns out, he and I, as graduate students, were working on, we were competitors. He was at, at UBC and I was at Caltech and we were working on the same problem. So I've known Mike for 40 years. Uh, but at any rate, Mike had been doing some experiments on isotopically enriched silicon and found that you could get extremely narrow optical lines in that material. And so because of that, he had been able to make a connection with the people who had this extremely good silicon. With his laser, he can resolve. So he has a one electron volt laser, right? 10 to the 15 hertz. 
he can resolve the hyperfine splitting of the phosphorus donor at 100 megahertz. It's that narrow a line uh, in isotopically enriched silicon in this very best material. So since I knew Mike, I managed to get pieces from Mike. He sends us what we need. Uh, so now we go to more lightly doped silicon, and we end up now with a curve. This is time in seconds. These are, this is a, uh, just a, an echo decay, and this one is of order a half a second or something like that. We haven't done any extrapolating or anything yet, because this is a quite lightly doped piece, about 10 to the 12 per cubic centimeter. So the, right, at 10 to the 12, uh, what, cube root of that? Uh, what, they must be close to a micron apart. Well, no, closer than a micron, but something like that. Far apart. Uh, and what you see is it's not a pure exponential. And we believe that's because there's a little bit of residual silicon 29 in there. Uh, and if you extract, if you fit that curve, so the silicon 29 in the simple case gives you a form like that. This is sort of everything else. And we can extract some numbers of about 8 tenths of a second from that curve. What is the threshold for how low you can go? How much signal we have? Uh, well, okay, it's hard to get doping below this. That is about the best. Maybe people have gone... Um, I think this is the best that the Avogadro people have made. Um, the very best silicon I've worked with is probably an order of magnitude below this, but that wasn't isotopically enriched or anything. Uh, and so now when you put it on these curves, so the dots are what we measure. This is at 10 to the 14. We're already up at, at sort of good fractions of a second. We do extrapolations. Uh, so the one I showed you was with a weak, it wasn't a pi pulse, it was a weak second pulse. Uh, and that one is here, and then when we do the extrapolation, we get up to several seconds for T2. And then the question is, well, what's going on now? And what we realized was going on, so this extrapolation procedure gets rid of some of the interactions. But if I have two donors over here, one up, one down, they can flip-flop. And another one over here can flip-flop. That causes a fluctuating magnetic field at this donor. So uh, a friend at Oxford that we work with said, hey, why don't you just put a field gradient on? So we claim, I mean, we, we say, you know, with field gradient. What a field gradient means is that on the door of my office I have these little magnets that you know hold papers on. We took one of those and stuck it on the magnet in our spin resonance rig. And the narrow line there goes to a broader line because we put an inhomogeneous magnetic field. And now you do this extrapolation. With no gradient on this particular sample we were able to extrapolate to 1.3 seconds. With the field gradient we could extrapolate to 12 seconds. We couldn't do this extrapolation with that most lightly doped sample because there just wasn't enough signal. Actually, we have a new system now that we might be able to do it. Uh, I sent the sample back to, to Mike, but maybe we'll get it back. So the bottom line is T2, we think, can be at least of order 10 seconds. And to be honest, what we're limited by right now are the interactions between the donors. It's nothing in the silicon other than just the fact that we have to have donors in there to measure. And we can't measure with one donor, we need a bunch. Uh, to give you an idea where things have gone, Jim had, Jim Gordon, back in the 50s, had a half a millisecond. Uh, remember, he did the first microwave spin echo experiment. So all these things about instantaneous diffusion and all the rest, none of that had been discovered yet. Right? He did the first experiment. So... Uh, what has changed is we've learned about some of these other things. By getting rid of this instantaneous diffusion, we are able to get rid up to about 60 milliseconds. Also, our material has gotten better. Uh, Jim had about 1,000 part per million. Here we had about 800. Then we were able, by going to lower temperature, it turns out donor, just donor flipping was causing a fluctuating field. We also got better silicon, uh, got up to about 6 tenths of a second. 
And more recently, when we figured out these donor flip-flops, yeah, we're up about 10 seconds. Uh, and we're also just getting better and better material. Okay. So what is the limit? The simple answer is we don't know. And, and that is, yeah, we really just don't know what the limit is. Uh, it can't get longer than T1, or in principle twice T1. Uh, we're still limited by donor-donor interactions, and there's residual silicon-29 in there. Now there are some, if you work with other donors, um, and really this isn't my talk because the suggestion came from this uh, friend John Morton in, at Oxford. Uh, he and Mike Thewalt have been working with bismuth dope silicon, and there you can get, uh, I'll just say it, if people are at all familiar with ion traps, they use these for atomic clocks. And they have what they call clock transitions. You have to put on a magnetic field, but now there are fluctuations in the magnetic field. So you go to a place where the frequency of the transition is to first order insensitive to the magnetic field. Right? So as a function of field, it goes like that. You go to that minimum where it's, there's no linear term. Well, in bismuth dope silicon, you can do that. And it basically gets rid of this to about a factor of 300. You make that 300 times smaller. So with the bismuth dope silicon, we can measure several seconds without any of these extrapolations or anything. It gets rid of a lot of the effects. Uh, distance. Hmm. Well, I sometimes can spell. Uh, in most quantum computing architectures, donor-donor distance would be larger. Well, in Bruce's... Bruce Kane, he had to have them very close together. But I, most people are trying things where they're putting them a little farther apart. I expect that T2 is a lot longer than 10 seconds, the limit. I don't know, but I'm expecting. And then the question is, do we need it longer? Well, bigger is always better, right? Uh, many other effects, though, come in in real devices. Uh, you have surfaces. You have interfaces. They're gate voltage noise. They're just lots of other things. So we have... This piece of silicon, absolutely pristine, a donor, right? These things are several millimeters in size. So the donors we're measuring are buried deep inside this piece of silicon. And so it's rather different from what the people who, who are making devices have to deal with. Uh, I promised I would say this is some new data we got. Nuclear T2. So I, somebody, I think, had asked a question about using nuclear spins as memories and... There are maybe advantages and disadvantages. I think that's up in the air. Here's some data we took recently, as in day before yesterday, uh, in one of these good pieces of silicon from the Avogadro project. Uh, took it a couple times. You notice it's pretty noisy. There are not many donors in there. There's not much signal. What you can do is what's called electron nuclear double resonance, ENDOR, also invented by George Fayer to study silicon uh, Phosphorus dope silicon. Uh, we believe that the nuclear T2 is being limited by these flip-flops. If you flip the electron spin, that will decohere the nucleus. And so we believe that's what's limiting us here. And uh, in more likely dope silicon, Mike has done two things. One, he uses a completely different way of measuring it, doing it optically, and he can use that to spin polarize so nearly all of the spins are spin up. So you can't flip-flop if everybody's spin up. We have about half up and half down, so there are plenty to flip-flop with. Uh, and he published uh, earlier this year about a three-minute nuclear T2. Uh, that was with dynamical decoupling. He can get about half a minute without dynamical decoupling. And uh, as I mentioned, um, yeah, just after he sent in and got that paper accepted, they managed to get the experiment going a little better, and they're up to, I think, something over 30 minutes. Uh, a friend who had worked with him on it said that, yeah, they'd go out to dinner and then come back to see where the data point was. Uh, and the question is, is it useful? I don't know, but right, bigger is better. Uh, longer is probably better. Uh, it may not be useful. We don't know. Uh, there's a question, gates and flying qubits. First, how are we going to do gates and how are we going to move any sort of quantum information? One qubit gates will probably use microwaves just the way we're doing here, flip the spins. Uh, Bruce suggested using this exchange for the two qubit gates. 
As I said, donors are very small. We can't position either the donors or the gates right now with sufficient accuracy when we do it the usual way that the semiconductor industry does. But Michelle Simmons there at University of New South Wales, she starts with a surface and an ultra high vacuum system and takes AFMs and STMs and can place atoms where she wants them and build it up that way. And then you can get them exactly in the lattice site or within one or two lattice sites of where you want it. Uh, I don't know if that's scalable. I mean, if you talk to somebody who does semiconductor production, they'd say, that's not, no, that's not a production tool. You'll never make it scalable. You know, can you make 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8 qubits and gates that way? Really don't know. Uh, there's also the question, well, can we move the electrons? Can we have mobile qubits? Not very good news on that. So this was one of the first measurements we'd done. Uh, free 2D electrons. What's their spin coherence? And T1 is about 2 microseconds in this sample, and T2 is about 3 microseconds. They're free to move around. And the problem is that they're free to move around. And so spin-orbit interaction. So where this comes from, we believe, is uh, first off, you notice T2 was longer than T1. That tells you that it's a fairly special sort of process. that requires some anisotropic relaxation mechanism. Abstractly, you can always think of a spin flip or decoherence as some sort of magnetic, fluctuating magnetic field sort of abstractly, that's what causes. So it appears that these fluctuating magnetic fields come from what's called the Rashba effect. So in silicon, uh, the spin orbit interaction is extremely small. It has to do with the nature of the band structure of silicon. But the, at the interface, so this was done in one of these quantum well structures, at an interface you break that symmetry. And you get a new term in the spin orbit interaction from this broken symmetry that uh, goes by the name of the Rashba or bichkov rashba effect. It has the form of you have an effective magnetic field that is always perpendicular to the momentum of your electron. So if your electron's going that way, it has a field like that. If your electron scatters, then the field changes. So now you have a fluctuating, as the electron wanders around, it's scattering. You have a fluctuating magnetic field, that's what kills T1 and T2. And what we did was if you looked at the correlation times from our, the mobility of our sample, you can back out. This Rashba field is pretty small, but it's real. Uh, to give you an idea, if you did that same experiment, well, if you got the maximum Rashba field you could, in gallium arsenide, you can get these numbers instead of a few gauss up around a Tesla. Uh, so everybody has that problem. So do we need the new qubits? And how far? So standard circuit model of quantum computation has qubits moving all around. Uh, but there are other nearest neighbor models that I'm not the person, I think we're going to have some lectures about it and we should listen to them. I'm not the person to, to discuss that. But cluster state, surface codes, and so forth. We may, in some of these things, we may need to move an electron a short distance. So if you only have to move an, a micron, right? You, electrons travel in, in a semiconductor about the fastest you can make them go is about 10 to the 6 or 10 to the 7 centimeters per second. Doesn't take very long to move a micron. So if all you have to do is move things a micron here or there to say build your cluster state, you could probably do that. Um, and yeah, in some of these things like these cluster states, uh, so John Morton put a thing on the archive a couple years ago where, yeah, at the very beginning he needs to use the electrons to entangle nuclei. And after that, you can get rid of the electrons and, uh, and use the nuclei in these uh, memories. OK, um, I have not left myself, but I'm going to go through it very quickly because I like it. Uh, lots of other electron spin. I've only concentrated on the ones with semiconductors, mainly because that's the ones I know about. That's my feel. Uh, well, we and other people are working on hybrid schemes of using Josephson junctions and uh, spins you can either use ensembles of donor spins and you can have an ensemble that you can you can store qubits in uh, you can also uh, Jason so Andrew Houck is sort of next door to me 
He does superconducting qubits. He and Jason Petta, Jason grew a, uh, a quantum wire, a nanowire, laid it across a superconducting transmission line, and they just had a paper come out recently where they were, they can make double dots by putting some gates on this nanowire, and they can probe it with the microwaves of a uh, superconducting uh, on-chip resonator. Other centers, uh, the one that's probably uh, most famous are nitrogen vacancy centers in Diamond. There are lots of people working on that. One of the beauties of that scheme is you can access it optically. You can, you can polarize them, you can measure them optically. And I'm just going to say a little bit about electrons floating on helium because that's what I, one of the things I do, and it's fun, and I'm late. I think I'm, well, okay, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, back in the, actually started in the late 60s, early 70s, people were studying electrons floating on superfluid helium. It's a two-dimensional electron system. Uh, you end up with, there's a barrier of about one electron volt, so the electron won't go into the helium. Uh, it sees its image charge, very small image charge because it's a, a rather low dielectric constant, but that's enough to bind it with a small energy. Uh, what's particularly interesting is that these things can have extremely high mobility. The highest mobility of any system anybody has ever studied. Over 100 million centimeters squared per volt second. Another guy down the hall, Lauren Pfeiffer, grows the world's absolute best gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide. He'd been at Bell Labs doing this for years. His best sample, I think, is now 37 million. And just right out of the box, you can get 100 million and, you know, no, no million dollar machine or something like that. You can also work at very low densities. You know, I'd said, well, in these very good samples, you can get down to 10 to the 10 and the very best samples, 10 to the 9. With electrons on helium, you 10 to the 5 is no problem. In fact, you cannot go above 10 to the 9. And that was why people dropped this. In the, through the 70s, everybody, it was, there were conferences, and there'd be the 2D electron people and semiconductors and the helium people. There's a, a hydrodynamic instability, and so you can never get a high enough density to make it a quantum system in the sense that the Fermi, and Fermi temperature is always much lower than you can get. So, uh, what we do is not our idea. There's uh, a group in France who came up with this, said, okay, we don't want to have to worry about exactly how we level this. We are going to make channels. We're going to have a top plane that's a, uh, a metal. We're going to have another gate down here. We can bias that positively. These channels are a couple microns wide, a couple microns high. The helium just wicks up. It's just capillary action. It fills these channels, and we're going to float the electrons up there. Uh, and it's very easy to make things that are precise. In fact, what we did was we went and had some friends at Sandia who have a semiconductor processing line, and they normally worry about all the, you know, this is, this is a diagram, their diagram of what's in their chip. We don't care about that at all. We didn't have any transistors in the whole chip. The only thing we had is they have five layers of metal gates. And so we do it to where now we have channels and we can have all these gates and so forth, and we can use those to move these electrons around. So you put all this into a copper cell. Uh, we have a UV light and some a zinc, and we photoemit electrons come down. We put electrons on the surface. This is what that chip looks like. Started out as there's the chip, a couple millimeters. We collect, we're only going to be looking at that piece, we collect electrons in these things we call reservoirs. All the interesting stuff goes on right in the middle here. And you can see we have a bunch of vertical lines there. So the channels are here. The shiny part are the regions at the top of the channels, in between the channels. These lines are metal gates that we can use to move electrons. You know, we can make one positive or negative, and in fact what we do is we hook this up like a charge coupled device. Uh, that's just sort of, our, our channels are three microns wide and about two microns deep. There's just a picture of the cell. There's a US penny, so get an idea of the size. Measurements, the way we're doing the measurements is, is fairly simple, is that we have what we call a sense gate over here. And if we park electrons above that gate, they induce a voltage on that gate. Down in the helium, we have a little preamp that uses a gallium arsenide high electron mobility transistor, 
And so it can see a small voltage change and amplify it such that we can then process that at room temperature. Uh, our noise on this is about, it turns out we had others that had a noise, total noise of about five electrons. Here, when we designed this, we hadn't realized then, we do now, uh, that we made actually the sense region too small. And so most of the electron gets screened by all the rest of the metal. Uh, and our noise is about 360 electrons per root hertz. So we can, we put 360, but we have 120 channels in parallel. So that's three electrons per channel per root hertz. Uh, and now what we're going to do is we're going to make this three phase CCD. Uh, the red's positive, so we have, this is the potential energy seen by an electron. We're going to have the next gate, we make it, then we make this one a little negative. Electrons go like that, they move across. And you shift it. And this was done by George Smith and Bill Boyle back when they first invented them. Uh, they had the, the, the first ones they made were three phase CCDs. Uh, I got this from George's uh, Nobel Prize lecture. You notice there's a trap there. In a real silicon CCD, they're always trapped. So you try and move your electrons, but a few get trapped. They don't transfer the way they're supposed to. And if we if these are quantum bits, we can't and we don't want them getting trapped and lost someplace. Right? We want to keep them. Uh, and this was something that they had to deal with very early on. Uh, as George said, it was pretty easy. I mean, it took them a couple hours to come up with the idea of a CCD. It took about a week to come up with the idea of what's called a buried channel CCD that gets rid of the sort of saves you from a lot of these traps. So what now, and hopefully I have not modified this animation, and so it should work. I tried it last night to make sure it would. So we have a bunch of electrons out in this reservoir. What we're going to do is we are going to make the door gate positive, let them in. The sense gate we make positive, we move them over. The thing we call a twiddle gate. Now they come over here, then they move another one. And they move another one. Again, they keep going, and then you get bored with that, and you transport them back and forth a few times. You'll notice that we had little places here. We had memories where we could put electrons. We had a vertical, so we can take them out of here and move them up there. That all works. But this is if it works ideally. If there are any traps, you'll get something like this. Right? The electrons won't all end up above the gate they're supposed to. Some will have gotten left behind as you're moving to the left, some get left behind as you're moving to the right, and you'd end up with this. So now what we do is we go and we measure it. And we see where are the electrons. And the bottom line is they all stay exactly where they're supposed to be. So we did some experiments with four electrons per channel, with one electron per channel. Uh, we transported one period, one pixel is three gates. We did a thousand pixels. We did a million pixels. We did a billion pixels, just back and forth. It, yeah, this is one of these experiments where you go out to dinner. Uh, we ended up transporting those electrons nine kilometers around this thing, and we didn't lose any. So we like this. Um, I'll say what we want to do is we want to reliably get one electron per pixel. Uh, we want to be able to initialize qubits. Another thing people are talking about, I won't say, is that people want a new current standard. They have very good voltage standard using a Josephson effect, resistance standard using the quantum Hall effect, but not a good current standard, not on the same level. And if you could do that, then you'd have all three parts of Ohm's law and you'd be able to make the whole thing better. So we're trying to do that. So how do you make a turnstile? Well, you do it the way people have done it for a long time. You just make it narrow. You make it narrow enough that only one can get through at a time. Uh, so we tried that. Uh, now this chip was made by IBM, and it turns out that's good and bad. Uh, a useful number is that the electrostatic energy at a micron is about 16 Kelvin, so it's high. They repel one another pretty, pretty strongly. So 
There are all these holes and so forth, our gates, our channels, it narrows down to 0.2 microns. IBM can make very small things. The only trouble is on this chip, see all those little dots? They put all kinds of little blobs of copper because they want a very uniform density of copper. That's how they, in their processing. They didn't tell us they were going to do that. Uh, we have a new chip now that gets rid of that. Luckily, I have a, a friend who, who works there and she's a manager and so she stuck it in. Uh, what about spin coherence? Simple answer, we don't know. Experiments are in progress. Calculations say minutes to weeks, right? The electrons in a vacuum, right? There aren't any nuclei around. There are almost no spin orbit. In fact, there are arguments that may be exactly zero spin orbit uh, interaction. Uh, so calculations say these things will, will go f for a very long time. Uh, one of the things that comes out of that is that the spin coherence, according to the calculations, is not, because there's no spin orbit, is not reduced by, uh, by movement so that we can move these electrons around without losing coherence. We don't know. Gates measurements, one qubit gates will probably use microwaves. We'll probably use quantum dots, just like gallium arsenide or silicon for two qubit gates. The only trouble is the mass of an electron is bigger than the effective mass of an electron in silicon by a factor of five, which is bigger than that in gallium arsenide by sort of another factor of four. So, so we need to make very small ones. So we've done a bunch of calculations on things like this. If we make it uh, 0.08 microns across, uh, then we can get a singlet triplet splitting that's large enough to do what we want. And here is that picture of IBM's SRAM at 22 nanometers. They can make these little gaps here that would be like a quantum dot are small enough. One of the beauties is, I told you, the problem with making those chips is that they damage the silicon. We don't plan on using the silicon. Silicon's just a substrate. It's just sitting there. You know, you have to build it on something, and they build it on silicon. We'd be just as happy to build it on glass. That's not what IBM wants to do. So uh, we don't care what damage they do to the silicon. And I believe that's all good, and I'm late. So I apologize for running over. I had a question about. Yeah, uh, I had a one. question about uh, your uh, uh, experimental data of current versus uh, versus gate voltage. Uh, On which device? Uh, where you had a peak. Ah, uh, uh, you mean the SET? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. This was Andrea Morello's experiment. Yeah. So, is it known whether that's a Lorenzian or uh, or a Gaussian? Uh, so it's a convolution of whatever the line shape is of that energy level, which, depending on its relaxation mechanism, uh, could be either one, and the thermal distribution in the contacts. And it's typically dominated by that thermal distribution in the contacts. So you have a, right, you have a, a contact here, essentially a metal here and a metal here, and there's always a smearing of KT at the Fermi surface. And in fact, this is often how you measure your electron temperature by building something like this and seeing how narrow it is. So it's usually dominated by KT. Okay, thanks. And in fact, Andrea told me that in that particular device it was. Usually by running over lunch, you suppress the questions. Suppose I, I like to make the best quantum dot. In, in which properties I have to focus if you want to make the best quantum dot, and you want to make a, a you want to make a quantum dot and use the spin of an electron, right? Uh, if you talk to five people, you'll probably get five different answers. Uh, in fact, you could talk to one person and get five different answers. I know Jason Petta is working on silicon quantum dots. He's working on gallium arsenide quantum dots, and he's working on quantum dots and indium arsenide nanowires. Uh, so there's no simple answer. If you're most concerned about spin coherence, silicon is 
probably the best material. I think people have pretty much agree that uh, it's the best material if what you care about is spin coherence. On the other hand, the technology and and so forth for doing silicon quantum dots is not as well developed and is fundamentally more difficult than gallium arsenide or these nanowires. And it's unclear as to whether they can get long enough spin coherence and then win by the fact that they're much easier to build. Um, I, my personal opinion is I like, I'm working on silicon uh, because I think that the others are going to have problems with, with spin coherence and I know uh, like Jason Pata, he started out with with uh, gallium arsenide, but then he saw the silicon was progressing, and so he he works on that too. Uh, his postdoc advisor, Charlie Marcus, I was talking with Charlie once, and Charlie figured, look, I know how to do gallium arsenide. I can get nature papers and all this, but once somebody else does the hard work of figuring out how to make the contacts and everything else in silicon, then he might switch to silicon. But it's... There's no simple answer to that question. Pardon? Uh, yeah, here we can. Instead of averaging in space, uh, if you want to do subpixel imaging, uh, if you assume that the functions are orthogonal, so can we get an image? An and image of, of what? Of the spins. I mean, let's say there are 10 raised to, I mean, let's say, not 10 raised to 7, but depending on the number of modes. You know, you can break it down into, say, 15. So you can do certain things. Okay. Um, in that, uh, I, I wouldn't call it imaging, but actually uh, these friends in Oxford... And, and working there, there was a collaboration between Oxford and Yale and various people where you can have an ensemble of spins. And now what you do is you put an inhomogeneous magnetic field on. And it's sort of like what you would do with, uh, with a, uh, magnetic resonance imaging. They weren't trying to image. What they were doing is, though, with one configuration of magnetic field, they could store a qubit. With a different configuration, they could store an orthog orthogonal one. And they were very excited until I was talking with Erwin Hahn, who had, he was the guy who invented spin echoes. And in about 1948, he'd done that. Uh, it was buried in some ancient papers. But yeah, so I don't think, I, so people aren't looking at imaging uh, directly that I know of in this. Um, in our case, most of the length scales are very small. And so trying to have a field gradient that would let you image on, you know, sort of micron scales would be, would be pretty difficult. Uh, I, I don't know anybody who's tried it. I guess in principle, there's probably no reason why you couldn't do that. Uh, it's similar to noise would be an issue. Also, uh, I guess the field strength required will be much lower because you're not trying to control the whole ensemble, but only, you know, you're... Uh, well, we aren't really, so the field strength I use is a third of a Tesla. On a scale of things, that's quite small. You can get that out of a, out of a permanent magnet. You can get permanent magnets that will get you over a Tesla. Uh, so we aren't bothered much by that, but yeah, you could. So people do do this so-called magnetic resonance imaging where they scan a, a little magnetic tip across the surface and do imaging that way. And there you can get very high resolution. Uh, and extremely high sensitivity, uh, but they've seen a single spin. It took 13 hours of signal averaging, but they saw a single spin. So I guess what uh, if you increase the uh, receiving resolution and the algorithms, basically you can sacrifice signal strength. Pardon? You can sacrifice signal strength. Yeah, and that's the problem. You sacrifice signal strength. But then you increase the uh, sensitivity. Well, you, you, you could get better spatial resolution, yeah. but you lose signal. And that's the battle that you're always fighting. Okay. Uh, so we, in particular, don't want to do that. We want the biggest sample we can get, most uniform field we can get, just to get more signal so we can work with a lower density of donors. Uh, in these things with like the magnetic resonance imaging with little nanomagnets, I don't think you'd ever get very good spin coherence in a measurement like that. 
just the, the zero point motion of the vibration of the nanomagnet would introduce a fluctuating magnetic field that would probably kill the spin coherence. Uh, I, I forgot, uh, I've talked to people who do those experiments. Microseconds is what I remember is, is sort of the longest they can, they can, you know, 50 microseconds or something. They're more concerned about T1 usually. They'd like to have a so-called T1 row. Yep. So um, I think there are lots of possibilities. I don't. Do I know anyone? So yes, actually, I have a I have a, a former student of a guy down the hall is at UT Austin, and Emmanuel is doing silicon and silicon germanium nanowires. Uh, the difficulty with the nanowires with silicon is that now you have an awful lot of surface, and silicon tends to have a lot of traps at the surface, and it's hard to put a large bend gap cap on that. So if you so what Emmanuel can grow is I think he's growing a germanium wire with a silicon germanium around it to keep the electrons away from the surface. Exactly. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of details of materials that, to be honest, I don't understand. He sent us some wires to try and measure. Um, the problem is they tend to conduct rather well. So he has to dope them very heavily in order to have some free electrons. I mean, doped up around the metal insulator transition. But yeah, no, there are lots of, there are lots of different directions that as materials and so forth, uh, technology, people learn how to do new things. No answer that I know. <laughs> You pick the one you like. Find one that you like that looks fun, looks like you have some ideas, and then go for it. Okay. Thank you.